Hi boys and girls. This week you are going to be studying biographies. And if you remember your Greek roots from earlier in the school year, you will remember that bio means life and graph means to write. So when we study a biography, we are reading about what someone else has written about someone's life. So it's the story of someone's life written by another person. You are going to read lots of biographies this week, but I'm going to start with one that I'm a big, um, big fan of this book, and I think you'll like it too. For your assignment today, you are going to listen to me read this story, and you're going to watch the whole video so that you can take an AR test on this book when we're done. So most of you have been doing your AR quizzes, and if you need help to log in, there is a sheet of directions in our homeroom materials course. So you or your parent could check there for directions. Let's get started. We are going to read a biography about John Deere. John Deere, that's who? While we're reading today, we're going to look for ah, good writing. So we might find that in imagery and we might find that in good descriptions of his life. Okay, here we go. John Deere, That's Who by Tracy Nelson Maurer. Back in John Deere's day, long before tractors and other newfangled contraptions, Americans dug the land with the same kind of plow that farmers had used as long as anyone could remember. That plow in the 1830s was surely less than perfect, but it worked. So who wanted to change it? John Deere, that's who. But John didn't set out to build a new plow right away. He was just another young blacksmith from Vermont, a hard-working one, mind you. His fine skills earned him buckets of praise. Still, times were tough, and folks sometimes failed to pay him. John's business struggled. Then disaster struck. His forge burned to the ground. Of course, John rebuilt it. And then another fire. Soon he was out of cash and out of luck. If you're wondering what a forge is, a forge is a blacksmith's workshop where the blacksmith uses fire to heat up metals like steel and to shape them into tools or other things that people need it. John needed a fresh start, so with a few of his best ironworking tools, he joined the stream of pioneers headed west in 1836. He planned to send for his wife and children when he was settled. Luck started to shine on him when he arrived in Grand Detour, Illinois. The little town needed a blacksmith to fix broken pots and pans, horseshoes and pitchforks, and shovels and plows. Lots and lots of plows. John quickly built a forge. Smoke poured from the slow fire that burned from sunrise to sunset, and sometimes longer than that. Clang, clang, clang. That's your onomatopoeia word, isn't it? And here's a close-up picture of what a forge looked like. So this is the fire where he would heat up the iron. And then here's an anvil where he would hammer it out to the shape he needed. That man was a workhorse hammering red-hot iron to repair tools so they were good as new. 
as good as new, even better than new. John also fixed the farmer's heavy iron plows again and again. Boys and girls, I want to pause on this page and talk about the importance of adjectives. Adjectives make our writing better. They describe the nouns in ways that help us visualize or understand. So in this page it says red hot iron and that helps us understand along with the picture that this iron or steel was so hot and then the heavy iron plows it helps us understand that um, these were heavy to lift and to work with so when you are writing about your um, person in your writing this week I want you to remember to use your adjectives and I also did you notice this The man was a workhorse. The man was a workhorse. This is an example of metaphor where we are comparing a man to a horse and we're not saying he's like a workhorse. That would be a simile. This says he is a workhorse or was. So that's a metaphor. When we use metaphors or similes, that is uh, imagery where we use words to create pictures in the reader's mind so another side note when you're writing your reports this week and next week can you try to find a place to add metaphor or simile or personification or very detailed descriptions to help the reader create a picture in their mind good writers do that Okay, back to the story. He's busy. Stubborn twisted roots deep under the prairie banged up the iron blades. Even worse, the thick rich soil the farmers called gumbo in a not so nice way stuck to their plows like gummy black snowballs. Farmers had to stop every so often to scrape the gumbo off with a paddle that made the day's work take a lot longer. And this time we do have a simile, don't we? Thick, rich soil stuck to their plows like gummy black snowballs. That's a simile. They're comparing the dirt to a gummy black snowball. John heard the farmers complain again and again. I reckon I'm cleaning that plow pretty near every few steps. It's going to take me forever and a day to plow my claim. Oof the, this heavy plow wrenches the dickens out of my back. They were tuckered out. Some farmers talked about hightailing it back east where the soil was sandy and easy to till. John didn't want to lose his customers. Truth be told, he missed his family and he had a debt to pay. That's when John set his mind to building a better plow. He tried new plow angles. He studied how the gumbo clung to the tiny pits in the iron. It's a fair guess that John already knew of other plow designs that called for lightweight steel rather than heavy iron. But steel was rare that far west and too pricey. Then one day at a sawmill in 1873, John found a broken steel saw blade that he could take back to his smithy, his shop. There John chiseled off the saw's teeth and cut the steel into the shape of a plow's blade. He curved it over a log so it would shrug off the soil. Then he polished the steel as shiny as his mother's sewing needles. Those needles could slip through calico like a hot knife through butter. Do you see the similes there? Comparing his blade to his mother's shiny sewing needles and comparing the smoothness to a hot knife cutting through butter. Maybe a shiny plow 
would slice through gumbo? Hmm, he's thinking. The town's families gathered at a local farmer's field to watch John test his gleaming self-polisher. They didn't expect much, but who amazed them all? John Deere, that's who. Stories of the day claimed he dug 12 rows, neat as you please. Many farmers were still leery. That means they're not so sure. John built several plows for farmers to try in their own fields. Test after test, John's smooth steel plow cut so quickly and easily, it truly hummed down the rows. In times, customers began asking for Mr. Deer's singing plow. And this is personification. Plows don't sing or hum. People do. So when we take regular th objects and give them people qualities, that's personification. And it makes writing much more interesting. Maybe you can use it. You can bet John was happy to send for his family in 1838 and mighty relieved to settle his debt five years later. In another five years, the entire Deer family moved to Moline, Illinois. John wanted his company closer to the Mississippi River for better water power and easier deliveries. And boy, we have sure talked about the importance of rivers in our Civil War unit, in the Ancient Civilizations unit you're doing right now. So here we see it again people living and working near the river to use its water and its power. All the while, John kept tinkering with the plow design to keep his customers happy. Under his leadership, John's company sold tens of thousands of singing plows and other horse-drawn equipment. Farmers plowed the prairie soil faster than ever. They planted more than enough food for their families Selling the extra crops, farming grew into a business. And the prairie's fields of grain became known as America's bread basket. So who changed the plow for America's farmers? Who changed a nation forever? John Deere, that's who. Here's a simple glossary. If you want to read about that, you can pause the video and read it. And since you will be taking an AR test, I thought I'd better read through this quickly. This is a page of more facts about John Deere and his company. So he lived from February 7th, 1804 to May 17th, 1886. And this is an important thing about a biography. You need to find the, the dates that your person lived when you're studying this week. John Deere wasn't the first American to tinker with plow designs. Before he became president, Thomas Jefferson sketched plans in 1788 for a new plow to turn the soil on his hilly plantation. Others, such as Jethro Wood in 1819, tried cast iron designs for plows with replaceable parts, but John was the first to, bend, to blend the best ideas about plow designs and steel parts to make a better tool for America's thick prairie soil. Many farmers who used wooden plows in the 1830s believed iron or steel would poison the soil. John let them test his steel plow in their fields to show it was safe. Before John Deere, most blacksmiths made plows one at a time as farmers placed their orders. Deere and company offered ready-made plows and sold them in branch houses across the Midwest. Pioneers bought their self-polishers at these stores as they traveled on their westward journey. John Deere was the mayor of Moline for two years after he retired. John Deere never lived on a farm. John Deere didn't invent the tractor. He died 32 years before his company bought the Waterloo Gasoline Engine Company and began selling the Waterloo Boy Model R the granddaddy of all John Deere tractors. Deere and company has sold carriages, wagons, and even bicycles in addition to plows and other farm equipment 
Today, it is one of America's oldest manufacturing companies. So the author of this book studied John Deere's life and picked the most important details. This is what you will be doing when you write your biography reports this week. You will be reading about somebody and choosing the important things, just like the writer did on this page. All right, boys and girls. Last thing I'll mention, a bibliography is a page where the writer shows the readers where she got her information. So she learned about John Deere by studying all these things. And you will learn about your famous person um, by studying websites and maybe books that you have at home. So you do not have to write a bibliography because you're only third graders. But someday you will. I hope you enjoyed hearing about John Deere today. And I hope this gets you excited about our biography unit this week. Have a great day, boys and girls.